is inadvertently uh, omitted. Right, um, thank you very much and thank you for raising that, Councillor. We now move to item number nine, uh, which is the independent review of health and safety at the ports. Um, so if I can have Sarah Johnson-Smith and Alistair Cameron uh, at the table uh, to talk to this. Um, can I just foreshadow, which I actually did when we had uh, the Maritime Union in front of us, um, that there is a Chair's recommendation at the end, and that is just, um, I've raised it with uh, Chasens and also in a discussion I've had with the Board of the Port, but I think it would be worthwhile having an audit of progress on the implementation of these recommendations being made by the organisation that made the recommendations. And uh, that's what uh, recommendation F is about. But um, I'll, I'll move this item. Do I have a seconder for the item? Councillor Cathy Casey and uh, Sarah, I think uh, you're gonna lead the discussion on it. Thank you. Thank you, Tina Koto Katoa. Good morning, councillors. Um, so this um, report represents, I suppose, the formal conclusion of the process that commenced last year uh, with the independent review of health and safety at the port. So um, as you're aware, the focus of Chasen's, um, who obviously were engaged to do this work, was to assess and comment on the port's systemic management of its critical risks for health and safety and the health and safety culture at ports of Auckland. So the final report was released um, 30th of March and it's appended for your um, reference to this document. And we did have an opportunity to workshop with uh, the report authors, um, Roger McRae and um, Chris Alderson from Chasins on this to, um, to sort of discuss with them directly um, their, their findings and the, and the key recommendations. Um, I mean, there are 45 recommendations in this report, so I won't go through them all, but I mean, effectively, the headline um, one is really they did identify that there are systemic problems at the port in relation to those matters. Um, and as such, they've made 45 recommendations um, to address that, which traverse a number of, of different areas. So um, in the report itself, the Chasms for each recommendation gave an estimated kind of implementation period and an estimated impact for each um, recommendation but they note that that's um, something that the port needs to evaluate as its own um, separate exercise. So um, what, what the next, we're sort of moving to the next steps, Council's focus as shareholder is really about ensuring effective oversight and that we have assurance around the port's implementation of that review, of the review recommendations. So as such, you'll see the recommendations we've got set out in B, C, D and E, and also additionally F. Um, so I won't read through those, but effectively, um, covers uh, an implementation plan, regular reporting on those recommendations, um, uh, safety cases that relates to straddle automation at Ferguson Wharf, and also reflecting this in the upcoming draft uh, SCI, which is due to us 1st of August. So um, that's a, a quick summary of the report. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. And just to draw your attention to two points in that recommendation that are really important. One, uh, the ports will be coming back here to be held to account, um, both in July and, and October at the governing body meetings. Uh, and the discussion that we had when we had the authors of the report here, um, if the straddle automation is going to come into effect within, some, within a couple of months, uh, that recommendation from the authors of the report needs to be acted upon urgently which is to know that there is a safety assurance framework for that project. And uh, I've asked specifically uh, in, a, in a letter to the ports that that be addressed. So we now open up for any questions. First of all, questions rather than comments. Uh, Councillor Pippacoon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Tēnā um, It's really good to, that we've got to this point of having the board in front of us. Um, still really concerned about the, the what's happening with the relationship with the union and what appears to be an ongoing very antagonistic relationship as if the union is oh, is yes. kind of the problem but I just wondered in terms of um, we are under B it says we will get asking for a copy of its high level plan why are we why are we focusing on a high level plan rather than the plan, like surely there is just one plan for implementation, and what do you see as a distinction with a high-level plan? And I guess the 
the question, so that's one question, but and related to that is we heard from MUNS that they haven't had any input into that um, implementation plan. Is that, do we see that as an issue or a gap or anything that we should be requesting that more work is done on that implementation plan that does involve MUNS? Um, thanks for your question, Councillor. I think um, with regards to high level plan, um, I suppose it envisaged that we'd be uh, expecting that plan, it may not be completely detailed at this point, but um, we'd be certain because there are 45 recommendations, so we may be expecting that some of it is dealt with in a high level way in terms of some of the stuff that might be more for those outer years, because the Chasons do recognise this as a journey that would be, you know, some things are from implementation they think could be done within the first six months, some kind of a year, and then some a bit longer. So it may, I think we use the words high level to reflect that some aspects of it may be more high level because of their nature in, in, that, in those outer years, but certainly in those in the immediate term, in terms of some of the actions they'll be prioritising straight away, we would expect that to be more detailed. So, um, yeah, we weren't envisaging there would be two separate plans, but that there would be one plan, but some of it, as I said, may have more detail than some of the, um, the other recommendations, just depending on where they're at with that implementation framework. I think probably we could actually delete the words high level. Uh, we just want a copy of their plan for the implementation. So that might make it easier, Sarah. So maybe if I can ask um, uh, our, our team to delete that and we'll just talk about the, their plan for implementation. That leaves it open. Thank okay. you, Mr Mayor. And I think that will just mean yep. that there doesn't end up being two versions and we're only seeing the... The sanitised one. I just, just there was a second, just part of my question in terms of how that implementation plan has been drafted and the input from months. Look through the chair. I'd refer directly to a couple of the key findings and recommendations in the report itself. Um, paragraph two point zero point eight says that POAL executive management needs to address perceived engagement and trust gaps between executive management and the frontline workforce regarding health and safety expectations. Um, from the observations and interviews made by this review, resolving this issue will be a significant challenge for POAL. I think the report quite clearly highlights that there does need to be a lot more engagement between um, frontline staff and the executive. And I, at a governance and ownership level, I don't think it's our role to dictate um, how Ports goes about preparing their plan, but I think the, your recommendations um, from the review itself make that reasonably clear that there should be a, a degree of engagement. I think following the public input today when, when Munns was here, I think um, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor both um, said that they would contact the Chair of the Board and maybe that could be a, pointed out. Yeah, and I, I reiterate that um, our advice, it's a very carefully used word, would be for the board to engage with and cooperate with the um, with the union over health and safety, which is in within the spirit and the requirement of the review's recommendations. So I, I don't want to get involved in a to and fro between the union and the and the board, but um, I think uh, Bill and I can both make it reasonably clear. Um, that the spirit uh, and the requirement of the review is that um, the union and uh, other workers uh, be involved in this process because that's that's essential if we're to achieve the outcomes that we, we seek. Right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Shane Henderson. Thanks, Mayor. And this might be more a question for us, but I'll just put it anyway. Um, our most direct line of control is through the board appointment process. So is there scope for workers' representation to be directly appointed to the board through us? Um, as you'll be aware, board appointments to... Thanks for your question. Um, board appointments are made through um, under delegation from the governing body by the Ports of Auckland appointment panel, on which the Mayor chairs and also Jim sits and the Ports of Auckland um, Chair. So we utilise our, um, our uh, company Carriage to help support us in that process. So there, there's, um, you know, nominations for appropriately qualified people can be, can be nominated, but it does go through um, a process, as does everyone, for, you know, candidate selection, interview, assessment, etc. So um, 
there's not sort of the practice of um, a direct appointment of third parties, but there are, you know, a number of candidates can be considered in the mix um, and they go through that, that process that Kira just suppose independently verifies um, and then on which the ports appointment panel make the decision. So does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor John Watson. Yeah, my question uh, follows on a little bit from Councillor Henderson's. Currently there, there are six directors on, on the board, is that correct? Yeah, so does this appointment committee have the ability to, to add over and above that six, or is it uh, sort of a, a kind of replacement basis? And under the memorandum of understanding, there can be more councillors, uh, there can be more directors than that. Uh, that would be a discussion we would then have with the the board of the chair, uh, the chair of the board. Um, I'd just like to make the point, I made it to the union. Um, we did seek, when we made the initial appointments, um, nominations from the both the Maritime Union of New Zealand and the Council of Trade Unions. We received a list of nominations. They did go through the normal process that Sarah talked about, and the result was that we got a person, one, one of the people that the trade union movement had recommended because of her expertise in health and safety appointed to the board. So I think that was seen and, uh, and, and acknowledged by the, the union as, a, a, as good faith. But it's not plucking somebody out from outside the process. It's about, um, you know, if, if anybody wants to come up with nominations for carriage to examine as part of the process uh, to be on that board, We'd welcome that from the unions, we'd welcome it from any councillor or for, from, from any other source. Uh, but it's important to follow the proper process uh, and how those appointments are made so that due diligence is done and we're sure that we're getting appropriate appointments. Okay, so thanks. So the follow-up question to that was, I don't know if it appeared in the body of the report as such, but certainly from the reviewers in our workshop, um, they made the recommendation as a response to, to a question that you know, it, it, it would be quite appropriate um, to have uh, an engineer, or a, at least, or a stevedore, even better, um, considered as part of that process. So what I'm hearing from the mayor, so I just want to check with the officers, is that um, that there is an avenue there for any interested party to proceed through that process to try and get um, some such appointment, if appropriate. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. And last question, Councillor Cathy Casey. It's not really a question, so I won't try to address it up. I do have a comment. So let's move to comments, and then we'll legitimise what you're about to do. Um, first comment, Councillor Cathy Casey. Um, do the staff need to stay here? Because it's not... Um, I'm, uh, it's not if a it's not a question, no, that's fine. Thank you very much um, to, um, to Sarah and to Alistair. Um, how do I start? Something that um, the union said today, that our job is to ask questions of the port. We've, we've all been in this room with the port, and guess where we got asking questions? Nowhere. I have absolutely no confidence in our current processes of accountability, and that's, uh, that's, I don't actually know how to do this. I was thinking it's fine for Bill and the Mayor to ring the board chair, but actually, four weeks ago, if we, sorry, not we, but if the Mayor hadn't proposed this independent review, it would be business as usual at the ports, which meant that every worker there is at risk because of various dysfunctional relationships and trust issues. Nothing has changed. Four weeks, that's what they've come back to tell us. Nothing has changed. So for me, it's just not enough. This is just not enough. I, I, and I know that you're going to tell me I can't direct the ports to do anything, but actually, we spent money on this independent review. We had the board chair on the day saying that they will, they will fully um, accept and work with the unions to implement all these recommendations. The union invites them for the first time to a meeting of the workers and they don't even get the courtesy of a reply from the board chair. I'm sorry, there's something really wrong there. And I'm probably not allowed to say this because it's crossing the boundaries of governance and management. But there is something really wrong there. 
And I'm not prepared to wait to change one director at a time to, to fix the problem of health and safety, which is putting our workers at risk at the port. And I, I don't quite know what to do, other than I was thinking about another resolution to say that we expect, as a result of the independent review, that management will work closely with the workforce and the unions to implement all the recommendations. If they haven't got that, and they obviously haven't, they need to see it in writing. So what you said, Mayor, you should put up there in writing, from all of us, unanimously. Because that's what's wrong. It's still business as usual, with no change. Sorry, that was just a rant. Thank you, and I'll, I'll reply to that in a moment. Um, but first of all, Councillor Watson, comment. Yeah, th thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, and I, I certainly have had to change tack a little bit in uh, the comments I plan to say. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a Peter and the Wolf element at work here. Uh, you know, at, at some previous point, you, you might have thought uh, the presentation today, well, that, you know, that's a union, let's go and hear the story from the management on the other side. But in between that, we've got a report that tells us what that story is. So uh, we have to take at face value what we're getting told today because that's what uh, our reviewers have said. Um, they started off by saying in their, in their report that uh, you know, there's clear academic evidence that the safety climate is directly linked to employee perceptions of management's commitment to safety, and that is a good measure because it is a predictor of injuries. Well, that's actually um, no revelation. Uh, that just seems to be fairly much common sense, as is um, the key influences of the safety climate are the CEO, senior management, and frontline supervisors. The CEO and senior management set the tone and prioritisation of health and safety. Um, so they're telling us what anyone that has any experience in any workforce knows, that um, that sort of direction and culture comes from uh, the top, and that workers respond on the basis of whether that appears genuine or not. And, and then everything beneficial flows from that. Um, certainly in terms of the, of, of the trust, and we, we know about that, that there's this chronic and, and ongoing lack of trust, which is presented euphemistically as, as a barrier to, to implementation. Well, I think we have, we have gone beyond that. Our reviewers have said, um, ultimately, the board must take responsibility. They've said that. Um, they mentioned in their verbal feedback to us for the recommendation of a, of a stevedore or at least an engineer on that board. I mean, we heard today, for goodness sake, they can't even get a person on the Health and Safety Committee. They weren't involved um, in the draft plan to implement uh, recommendations. This is after the report. This is after them coming here and getting the, you know, the supposed grilling from the Auckland councillors. Um, they didn't even attend a stop work meeting after the report. I mean, how bad does it have to get before there's a more meaningful response from us as the councillors? Because we have a responsibility here. Um, um, and. <laughs> I guess our, our performance to date hasn't been all that impressive. And, and I, I do have a bit of sympathy for the management because one of the consistent things they actually have said to us is that the consistent undermining of the ports of Auckland by people from within this room, whether it goes to um, selling off the port or moving the port, has undermined the workforce and the management. They, that's the one consistent thing they have said. Um, I mean, we have councillors, um, you know, chairs of committees writing to the government, talking about, you know, asking the government if they want to buy up 50% in the ports of Auckland. So that's had an effect, undoubtedly, on the morale and the overall atmosphere with which these people have to operate. But that can only go so far, and we've well and truly gone beyond that in terms of the, the really the lack of meaningful response to this very damning and, and largely uncontested report. So credit to the Ports of Auckland, when they give their response to the re review, their hands are up, basically, they, they've given up. They, they accede to all the criticisms there. But what we have here is a classic situation of all the right words, all the plans, all the recommendations, but with no real apparent change with the personnel that are involved. 
and that's at the crux of it. Plans, policies, recommendations are only as good as the people who are implementing them, and we have a real issue here. I was appalled the other week at the treatment of um, a couple of colleagues around here when they asked a simple question. That was four weeks ago. I asked the question, has that information been given to those councillors in that interim? Well, there you go. There's your answer. A simple question, and a month on, you're getting the same treatment as the stevedores down on, on the wharf. So I would say, um, colleagues, that it's enough time on the mixed messages from Auckland Council. I saw the little encounters after that appalling meeting, and you know there was the usual round of back slapping and, 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 and small chit chat. I don't take that as an effective follow up to that sort of behaviour. So I'm just wondering what we're going to hear, hear in terms of response on the basis of the presentation from the Maritime Union um, today. Because we do have a rather unfortunate habit of saying one thing and then doing another. We had an example of that recently where in response to uh, the CCO review, the $800,000 CCO review, where it made comments about Panuku's need to balance commercial and private interest, commercial and public interest, I should say. We, we had an item that came up, uh, which was then led off by none less than the chair of the CCO committee, undermining that public interest, or at least negating it. So as much as we are told that you know a word will be told to the passed on to the, the board chair or I don't think that's really sufficient. Councillor Casey called for a resolution. Um, I think after our presentation today, that's the least we can expect. And, and I, I don't really want to wait to July for the next update as a, as a consequence of what we heard today. So as much as we all know how we're constrained with the legislation, I think we've been remiss in our response to date. And that follows on from as recently as a month ago, where we sat here and allowed a couple of councillors to be treated in a very offhand manner and still no response. So I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, I want something uh, a little bit more dramatic, a little bit more meaningful, because we've been told today that nothing has changed in terms of the personnel. OK, um, I want to take a call now, which still reserves my right of reply at the end, because I disagree fundamentally with a couple of things that have been said. The first thing, nothing has changed. That's not true. The situation around health and safety has changed fundamentally at the ports. Otherwise, <laughs> why did we set up the review? Why did we have the public recommendations? Why did we have in front of us a series of recommendations that say and will, will prove that these are not words but these are recommendations, 45 of them set out, detailed, that they have to respond to every one of those and say, we have progressed these recommendations. That's what's changed. Mixed messages from council, not at all. This council, this council right now, has done more than the preceding three or four councillors before it in terms of making it absolutely clear that we will not tolerate fatalities and a culture of uh, health and safety on the, at the ports that was appalling. I don't know how directly I have to say that. I've said it publicly. I went down and spoke to the board last Monday and I laid it out to them again. I said, have a look for yourselves at the report by Maritime New Zealand into Leslie Galberger. Have a look at the report uh, from WorkSafe uh, on Laboom Dyer and tell me how you managed to allow that to happen when you had rules that weren't monitored and weren't enforced. There were no mixed messages. I was as clear as it is possible to be clear and I've said that in this chamber and I've said it to their faces directly. So what we have are 45 clear recommendations. We have two report back sessions to this body where we will be asking the hard questions about what they've done and how far they've moved and what they still have to do. On top of that, we have an expert body 
that made those recommendations that will be reporting back to us publicly about how far they've gone in implementing them. We have on the Health and Safety Committee a person that was recommended by the Council of Trade Unions and endorsed today by the Maritime Union of New Zealand and by the Council of Trade Unions that will ensure those things are happening. So I simply don't accept that we are sending mixed messages or that nothing has changed fundamentally. There are still changes to be made, including on the makeup of that port. Jim and I are working on that right now to make sure that we are confident that three new directors appointed to that board will make a difference and will have a change of attitude. So I just want to put those things clearly on the table. I can't think of what more we could have done as a council to get the result that we want on this. So I'm sorry if I sound passionate about it. I've invested hours and hours and hours of time in getting the result that we all want, which is a safe port. And I won't rest until I'm assured, absolutely assured, that we have achieved that. And, the, and I'm speaking for the chief executive uh, as well on that. So um, the next uh, comment uh, comes from Councillor Shane Henderson, please. Thanks, Mayor. That will be hard to follow. Um, look, I want to acknowledge uh, the families affected by health and safety in this. I think we should always be doing that. And today, the family of Amo Kalati, who spoke publicly this morning for the first time, and it must have been the hardest thing for that family to do in the whole world to go through. Um, you know, putting a face to that pain should, from our perspective today, be a reminder of the importance of what we're discussing today. Um, Regarding uh, board appointments, Council Watson and I are in a bit of a tag team today on this. Um, you know, I think that if the workers are willing, we should be looking at workers' representation on the board. I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, there is a recommendation in the independent report to work closer together, and we've heard today that that hasn't happened as yet. So we need to use the levers that we have to act when we can. The health and safety situation has changed and it has improved. I want to acknowledge the um, points made by the Mayor here. I think you're exactly right in that. And furthermore, I'd say that we should be thanking the Mayor for the hard work on this and for leading this publicly and in his office late at night working on this kind of stuff. Um, but where there is still a sticking point is that the public don't just want things to change and to make things safer. They also want accountability. And I think that's fair enough. We need to remember the beautiful Māori concepts of rebalancing, of the maintenance of balance and harmony in a situation in a community, and that wrongs are put right. That's what people expect, that's what the workers expect, that's what Aucklanders expect, and that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson, and finally, Councillor Hills. Thank you, Mayor. And I just quickly want to acknowledge, first of all, the workers and their whānau who have been telling us this in the public, uh, the issues at the port for a very long time. And I also want to acknowledge Councillor Cathy Casey, who even, I think the first time I ever saw Cathy speak was on this issue uh, many years ago when I was a local board member. And she has been saying this over and over and over. And people have dismissed Cathy many times mm -hmm. and said, don't worry, there's no issue. Um, you know, the, the, the treatment of Cathy sometimes over the last couple, many years on this issue has has not been um, okay at all. And I think that, you know, she deserves some of the credit for finally pushing um, these issues out into the open and acknowledge the mayor and the mayoral office for, for doing what we keep getting told that we couldn't do is have a review of this nature and have priorities of this nature. As we keep getting told, it's none of our business, literally, as Councillor Watson said a few weeks ago, being told pretty simple questions were none of our business. Um, well, it is our business. The port's 100% owned by the council and the people of Auckland. And people, workers have had to die and be injured for this to be taken seriously, which I think is a worst, worst, worst case scenario. Um, some of the issues, and I won't go into them, but the, the figures the the triple alarms the, the the things that have happened which are systemic they're not accidental they're not user error um, a safe workplace you know all all workplaces have accidents but 
ex a workplace should be safe enough that user error or accidents do not kill people or injure people. There are ways, there are systems in place, and it's clear from the, the, the words on the report and the presentations we've had that there are serious issues that are now being rectified but actually need our, our continued focus in that area. And I think, you know, I think there are other issues, relationships um, that need to be addressed. Some of the questions I asked were around, you know, whether the board and the management felt they were separated enough to be holding the board holding the management to account. And I want to see more clear, um, uh, what's the word? I want to see that happening more or, or proof that that's happening, that the board feel they're able to keep the management to account. Um, the fact that the automation has no safety plan after all these years of planning, the, the, the fact that the health and safety doesn't sit in a higher tier of reporting on, on such a potentially dangerous workplace uh, are concerns that I hope are getting rectified. But yeah, I, I guess for me, this is a sad but positive move forward, but uh, I just want to put it back out there to the workers and, and the, their families who've been telling us these things for a very long time, and now it's in black and white. Um, the proof is there, but also um, thank you again, Mia, and those who've worked on this, and Kathy Casey for, for saying these things for a decade or so. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, I've just, uh, and I'll accept it from the Chair, um, an amendment, it's not an amendment, sorry, it'll be accepted as a recommendation uh, by the Chair, uh, which reads, expect the Board and Management of the Ports of Auckland will engage closely with the workforce and the union representatives to fully implement the health and safety recommendations of the independent review. That's uh, courtesy of Councillor Cathy Casey. I'm very happy with that, happy to, uh, I think that picks up some of the points that have been made around the table as well. Um, Councillor Tracy Mulholland. Thank you, Worship. This is actually the first time I've ever spoken on this matter. I have listened to a lot of the information. Um, I would like to thank the staff for the report and the work that is done in the background and also thank the earlier presenters and um, Russell and Craig. Uh, one thing, Your Worship, was I was somewhat surprised to hear the feedback um, from that presentation that some of the um, aspects of relationship building that we were promised haven't taken place. So I'll be very brief and just say I'll tutuku and um, support your words, Your Worship, and we do need to do better. So um, I do support the actions of actually building better relationships and having a much better health and safety record. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Councillor um, and Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore. Thanks, Mr Chair, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, the port's been through some difficult times, and there's no question about that, and the, the loss of life is absolutely tragedy, and all of our hearts go out to the families and surround that. It's, it's, it is not acceptable. It's how we go about changing that mentality and how we go about changing that thought and actions by the management and the board is it's a critical part. And that's about our relationship with the management and with the board in particular. And we've got to get that into a lot better place. And if you can want to call it chummery or whatever it's not, it's not. It's about actually building trust and acceptance between the board and us. And that's been lacking. And I think part of the CCO review's work is to absolutely build that trust up. It's been mentioned in the, uh, by Roger McLean and Chasm's report, and it's certainly mentioned by the CC review recommendations. And that's critical. Overall criticism and negativity won't work here. We have to build the level of trust and understanding across the board. And it's a two-way street. Thank you, Tracy. So, Mr Mayor, I support the recommendation. Cathy, thank you for your extra bit on there. I think that's, that's well focused. Having been an employer, and still are one, how will you get on with your staff is critical. And that's about them trusting you and you trusting them. And we've got to do that. So thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor and uh, Councillor Fessor Collins. Yeah, th thanks, Mr Mayor. I wasn't planning on speaking to this item today, but I'm grateful that people have. Look, I uh, thought I'd go and stand behind uh, the three amigos who took their petition to have Gibson, you know, wanted or demanding that Mr Gibson resign. I just stood behind them and made sure that they knew where the port was uh, so that they knew that where they were going that morning. I, I, when I used to lecture in education, we always used to talk about the need for the relationship and for that relationship to have trust. 
The research tells us that teachers are able to move a student's achievement rate by 30% if they have a good relationship with them. So a student who's sitting on around 40% could go right up to 60, 70 even, with a good teacher-student relationship. The same relationship can have a detrimental effect on the student by 30%. So you could have a student sitting on 60% who'd go right down to 30% because of that teacher-student relationship. It's all built on trust. We've heard that this afternoon. I didn't see any trust in our relationship when their board came here and we had their chair here. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to say things that were said in that confidential workshop meeting, but I struggled to see how there was trust. And the people, if you watched Carlotti's family who were on breakfast this morning, you would feel that one of the basic elements of what they were saying was there's been extremely little trust. That family's in South Auckland. It's one of our families. And we can sit here all day and talk about, oh, we've got to get the governance structure right. But the reality is it's our workers. And this report tells us that there's a different culture between the night staff as there is with the day staff. And when are our people there? Are they in the night staff? That's when our people are there. This family waited three hours in the freezing cold while their loved one was tried to get rescued off a ship. He was already gone. And we've got to understand that really clearly. He's one of our boys. This is one of our dads. He's young. This is the aspiration that we talk about in South Auckland all the time. And so whilst we're trying to establish trust at this end, the reality for people like Councillor Filipina and myself is we've got to face these families and prove to them that this is going to happen. I don't have the same level of confidence in building the trust relationship given what I saw in that workshop just a few weeks ago. And I'm really disappointed. Look, Mayor, I, I'm glad you're as passionate as you are, and I'm glad this report was produced, and you led that work. So well done to you, but by golly, this is a struggle for me. Because this is about how we build trust amongst those who are working. We've heard from the unions. Yeah, we might do a little bit more. I like what Dr. Casey has put up there with G, but I'm still not sure as to how we're going to see the workers and the unions and the management working closer together. But yeah, we're going to get some reporting on it. But I think it's time we really demand it. Given the, the, the temperament of your speech, Mr. Mayor, it's that level of demand that I think the people of Auckland are after. So I commend you for that passion that you've shared this afternoon or this morning, because that's what I think our families, in particular the families in South Auckland, are after, because they're the ones that are employed there. So I hope that we all take that same level of passion and commitment into an ongoing building some kind of relationship that's going to work, because what I have seen to date has not convinced me at all that they're about being in this relationship. And I think we're trying our best to warm them up, but I'm not convinced that they are. And so my disappointment is that I still think we're dragging people into this relationship. And if there's going to be trust, I'd like to see a whole lot more from the Ports of Auckland. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor, and uh, you know, concur with those comments. Um, sorry, we have uh, another call now. Councillor Josephine Bartley. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I wasn't planning on speaking on this either. Because um, I think the point has been clearly made that the relationship is not good between um, between us and the Ports of Auckland um, CEO and, and the, the board. We've raised about the families, um, that they are our own. And I just... Um, you know, I don't, I don't listen to the ones that keep calling for people's resignations. People are calling for my resignation on the Onihanga Facebook page that I'll be gone by lunchtime. So I don't want to be like them, but I agree in this instance about calling for resignations in regards to the ports of Auckland. I think of things in terms of my own family. If my family was going to go work at the port, you know, where would I sit? And I wouldn't want them to go work at the port. Um, I went bananas because my family were affected by the 
the Eastern Busway changes and it's just too dangerous for people to drive there. So I feel the same thing with Ports of Auckland. And this report backs that up, like 45 recommendations. It is a dangerous place to work. Why would we want our families to go and work at the ports? So, you know, I look at, I look at the comments, like the only reason those voices came through in that report was because they were anonymous. So what kind of workplace culture is going on there? And you know, I, I love the diversity inclusion policy that says they support their people, their employees bringing their whole selves to work. But clearly that is not the case because these people had to go anonymous in order to get their, their concerns and their experiences heard. So, you know, I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt and help them out, you know, ask them questions about, are you being a successful business? Because that is really the only remit that we've got as shareholders. And even they acknowledge that they're not running a successful business. So they say that and we go, yep, yep, so bad, so bad. So, you know, it is on us now. And I do acknowledge everything that you and Jim have done to get them to the stage, to getting new board members appointed. Um, but yeah, it's it's not enough. So um, I agree with what everybody is saying around here. We need to do more. And we need to do what we can to change that board by sacking them now. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. In reply, um, I look, I understand and share the emotions that surround this. Three people are dead. Uh, they were, we can say about the first two, the third is still under inquiry. Um, we should remember that. That's um, uh, Amo Kalafi. Uh, there will be a WorkSafe report in due course. Uh, I'm not going to preempt that. I can't, and it would be wrong um, to, to even speculate it, on it. But three people are dead. For two of them, there were systemic problems that led to their deaths. I knew that. I knew there was a serious problem on the wharf with a, a poor culture of health and safety without even having to set up a review. I asked you to vote for the setting up of the review because I wanted to do move beyond the emotion of the anger at the loss of these lives to a constructive way in which we could prevent that happening again. And that was the value of the review, not to tell us what we already knew, that there was something fundamentally wrong at ports on health and safety, but to give us a blueprint to enable us to address those problems and to resolve them. We can't do anything about the lives that have been lost, but we do have an obligation to act to prevent other lives being needlessly lost. And that's what this review and its recommendations enable us to do. Not one of us around here, despite how passionately we all speak about it, are experts on health and safety. So we pulled in experts on health and safety to say what is wrong and how do we fix it. And we have that. The next step now is to ensure that those recommendations are not given lip service to, but are fully implemented. And the recommendations in the report before us today should give us comfort that that will happen. I don't know what else we can do beyond that than the, the belt and braces approach that we have now or will be adopting shortly to make sure that we get the outcome that we need on the wharf. So uh, I endorse that. I endorse um, Councillor Casey's uh, recommendation. That is our expectation. I said that to, to Munns this morning. Our expectation is that the recommendations the detail and the spirit of them be implemented. And that means the involvement of the union in, in that. These are the people that are at the, at the work face and they need to be involved. There's some wisdom there, there's some experience there. And whatever differences might exist between management and union, that should not translate into not cooperating fully to stop the unnecessary loss of any further life or any further serious injury uh, on the waterfront. And that's what our expectation is, and that expectation will be conveyed very clearly uh, to the Ports Board. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I think we've got 
a very good basis for carrying this further. And I am expecting to see other changes. We're talking about health and safety at the moment, but there are a series of other uh, shortcomings in terms of the performance of the ports that I also addressed with the board earlier this week. On every indicator, they are not doing as well. They are not doing. Uh, they are not competing effectively uh, with with other ports. And we are the shareholder, and we are acting on behalf of our ratepayers. We've made an investment in this port, and we want it to work well, not by simply slamming it at a distance, but by ensuring that the changes are made to ensure that it will work well. And the changes that we can control are changes in the appointment of the board, who then have the responsibility for the employment of the chief executive. So um, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Uh, I declare that carried and carried unanimously. Right. Um, we now come to item 10 on the agenda, uh, which